Hey everyone, this is Trace. Thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. This is episode two of three in our series on noise. And I am here with special guest Mike Rugnetta. Hello. Mike does a podcast called Reasonably Sound. Maybe you've heard of it. If you haven't heard it, you should. It's great. I agree. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like you would like it. <laughs> so, Mike, real quick, before we get into everything, why yeah. are you here? Uh, uh, because we're friends. Yeah, well, yeah. that that one. Uh, I'm the creator and host of a podcast called Reasonably Sound, uh, which is about the science, culture, and theory behind all things audio. So it's like looking at not just interesting sounds and where they come from, but also looking at how people experience them and what they tell us about the world uh, and how we can sort of understand culture and people and technology through listening. Cool. So that's... That's, again, since it's Noise Week, I figured, hey, Mike, what's up? I know some things about those things. Yeah. This is Noise Week, which means Seeker is going to create a whole host of episodes about the overlooked or overheard? Why don't those things mean the same? They kind of mean the opposite. That's so weird. Uh, About noise. In this segment, we're going to explore what noise really is in nature and also in our minds, how noise works in our brains, how it's used for communication, and how noise affects us and other things around us. And of course, how it kind of stresses us out. Yeah. Yeah. Plus the physiology, psychology, and all the other ologies surrounding all of these topics. But first, we need to get to where noise in nature comes from. So let's kick into it. The state of being dirty is called matter out of place, right? This yeah. is something we were talking about the other day. Yeah, so uh, Mary Douglas, was a, uh, she's a sociologist. She wrote this really famous book in, I think it was like the mid-60s, um, called Purity and Danger. Mm. And she established this idea that um, dirt is uh, what, she d- what she described as matter out of place. And that it's like, you know, your shoes are more dirty when they're on the coffee table mm. than when they're off your feet and on the doormat. Interesting. Uh, even though they are, they might have the same amount of dirt on them in both of those situations, you would consider one of them more dirty than the other. Because it's kind of the wrong spot for shoes. Yeah, so it's so it's matter out of place. I'm hearing my mom, like, in my brain right now. Like, Get your <laughs> shoes off the couch. Yeah. Yeah. And so that like sort of establishes this idea that there's a, there's a sort of cultural aspect to it that mm-hmm. like there's there's the idea that your shoes on the coffee table are wrong for a whole host of often social reasons that it's a right. a sign of something being out of place yeah uh, and in noise week in talking about noise this makes sense as well like you can kind of extend that that idea to sonic phenomena and there was actually there was a guy who 30 years before her book uh, so he sort of presaged this a little bit. In like 1930, uh, a physicist, I think his name was Kay, describes noise as sound out of place. Hmm. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. I got a full quote from him. Oh, sure. So this guy, George William Clarkson Kay, uh, 1931, British physicist, he said excessive loudness, its composition, its persistency or frequency of occurrence, or alternatively, its intermittency, its unexpectedness, untimeliness or unfamiliarity, its redundancy, inappropriateness, its unreasonableness, its suggestion of intimidation, arrogance, malice, or thoughtlessness is what makes something noisy or sound out of place. Man, that guy was... Very specific. He had a lot of thesauri. Yeah. Thesauruses. But I think it's, right, like, it's complicated. It's hard to say what noise is without bringing in all of these... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something we talked about a little earlier in the series is that noise is very much about perception. It's not so much like, this is noise, this is not noise. Um, The example that we used earlier was astronomers might be looking at the whole universe, but they really just want the noise from that quasar. Mm. So they have to filter out all that other stuff. It's not that the other stuff isn't important or won't be valuable later or to a different astronomer. Right, but to that astronomer at that moment, everything else is noise and they just want one quasar. And that's sort of applies more broadly as well because these kind of inappropriate and unreasonable yeah. those are value Unti- words. untimeliness yeah it's like that that's like your opinion man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever k um, and then with, there's also this problem i think that natural noise is different from anthropogenic noise it like feels different a, a bird making noise feels different somehow than a human making noise yeah like there's a uh, or like uh, like a rainstorm yeah. Or uh, like whale song or mm-hmm. whatever. Like when in reality it's very noisy, it's not necessarily considered noise. Yeah, I think there's like a there's a naturalism bias or something. Ooh, yeah, that sounds that's that sounds bad. <laughs> like like we have a bias toward this not being noise, but in reality, the sound pressure is the same. Yeah, 
And I think a lot of times the, like, the frequency content is the same too. I think that there's, it, it sort of lines up with the sound out of place idea because I think we have a, a, this sort of, I don't know, impulse to think of things that we associate with coming from nature as thinking, them at, thinking of them as just better. It's hard for them to be out of place mm -hmm. because they are natural. They can never be right. where, sh where they shouldn't be yeah. because they are part of the natural world. And so... Right. So somehow we stand apart from that. Yeah. It's like stuff we build is not natural, yeah. but stuff that birds build, like a bower bird builds a little thing, that's natural, yeah. even though it's a construction. It's funny. It makes me think of like well, like a woodpecker sound. Like woodpecker actually is kind of irritating, but it's like that's almost construction noise. Yeah. Yeah, almost. Yeah. That's weird. So wherever you are right now, just kind of pop out your headphone and just listen just for just for a few seconds. Do you hear all that? The drone of a fan or rumble of a highway, the wind in the trees. I don't know where you're sitting at the moment. Maybe even just like people talking at your office or typing or, you know, all of those sounds. The, the hum of like electrical machinery is a pretty common one that you would probably hear in air, HVAC systems. Yeah. That's all noise pollution. It's all noise. Even if it's natural, even if it's not natural, it's just kind of extraneous energy being thrown out into the world. And it's incredible because you didn't probably notice that it was there before you popped out your headphone and listened to it. Yeah, you habituate to those things pretty quickly. Right. You just ignore it, which is pretty incredible because your brain has to filter all that crap out all the time. I mean, the rainforest is noisy, as we sort of touched on, and noise just kind of happens. I found this research guide from Harvard where lungfish actually lack a middle ear to sense pressure changes, okay. but they're able to detect sound through air vibrations, Yeah, which I also think is fascinating because it's a fish. Air vibrations. Air vibrations. Which is funny. Um, but hearing is just that. It's just being able to detect the movement of air, right? It's just air is moving around and we can sense it. It's like a lot of insects, uh, like caterpillars hear through the hairs on their body. Mm. Um, I think some... Some crickets or all crickets? I'd have to check. Mm -hmm. But I can actually, they hear through their legs. Oh. Like, or, you know. Maybe they, the hair is on their They legs? pick up vibratory information through, you know, yeah. their outside bits and can, in a sense, hear. Though I don't think, we, like, humans would not understand it as Right, we wouldn't have this. hearing, yeah. per se. That's fascinating. So, hearing actually dates back millions of years for us. At some point, amphibians moved out of the water and they needed a sense similar to the lungfish where they could sense the vibration of the air around them. Mm -hmm. And it was evolutionarily advantageous in some way. This happened about 350 million years ago, depending on the source. So eventually these uh, amphibians evolved to get tympanic membranes that could actually make noise Eardrum. on top of, yeah, picking yeah. it up. So like those frogs that go like, boom, oh, and yeah. sound like rubber bands and things. You know, that's a way to communicate. It's good for mating. And it evolved from a similar area of the body, a similar structure, to get this, like, noise making from noise picking up. It's kind of the same idea. And so this is when nature started to actively make noise, right? And now animals and non-animals make noise all across the spectrum, which is pretty incredible because we had to evolve a way then to avoid all of that. It's like other frogs likely had to evolve to avoid the first frogs, yeah. right? Like, oh, that noise is annoying, <laughs> right? You don't have, you know, they didn't evolve uh, ear lids. Oh, yeah. That would be helpful. Can we evolve those? Some ear lids? Yeah. Maybe we're on our way there. Really maybe nice. with all of the, maybe this is the next evolutionary step in the human ear. With all of the city noise you have to contend with, you can just... You whoop. just close these up? Yeah. Let's close these bad boys? I don't know. It's like the... I don't want to spoil a quiet place for anybody. Uh oh. Spoiler. Should I just say it anyway? Just say it anyway. Yeah, you know, like the <laughs> monsters in Quiet Place, they have, you know, they're very sensitive, but they can open their. Yeah, and their, like yeah. get a even more. Even sensitive. more sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. I don't want that. I don't want to do, <laughs> I want to do the opposite. Yeah. Um, but speaking of that, though, like the mammalian brain is incredibly good at picking up auditory signals that it wants to get out of noise. 
we sort of talked about this at the end of the last series, and you weren't here, but we were emailing about it. You called it the cocktail. Oh, the party cocktail party effect. effect. Yeah. yeah, where if you're at a, if you're at a loud like you're at a loud cocktail party and you're talking to someone, uh, you can pick out their voice from just a, the huge crowd of people, and you can actually hear them. But it is partially visual. Mm. They're like you know, there's a sort of there's there's you can hear uh, a little bit better things that you are able to sort of focus in on visually. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can your, your brain is very very good at. Uh, picking out specific sounds in a in a din. Mm, yeah, and the, this is something that has been traced back in other animals. I want to be clear; they've spotted novelty detector neurons in the dorsal and external cortex of the inferior colliculus of mostly like rats and mice. Rats. Okay, yeah. novelty detector neurons. Mm -hmm. What? I know. That's yeah. cool. So yeah, it's pretty great, right? And what it does is. Uh, they pick out new in, when it comes to your auditory input. So this is like, uh, like you have your standard sound bed, mm -hmm. your, your soundscape. Like all of the people at the restaurant, yeah. whatever, you know, yeah. watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Yeah. Watermelon, watermelon. Watermelon, yeah. watermelon. Someone drops a plate? Like, is that the... That is it. Yeah. Then you have, what? This is great. What happened? And your brain lights up in this area. Or allegedly, again, so, mostly spotted... In yeah. Rats. So in the so the like the evolutionary dis defense or description of this is like that's a twig breaking when mm -hmm. something's approaching it. Exactly. Mm. So it's all about repetition. We habituate so easily, so the neurons kind of get bored. So they have this spike of activity when something new happens, and then they get bored, and then they get bored, and then a, a twig gets snapped, and they get excited again. Right. Woo -hoo -hoo. Uh, and they use these neurons to pay attention to all sorts of other things in their environment, and it's you know. Speech, which is new constantly. It's a constant newness versus the drone of yeah. the air conditioner or something. And that's how we start to get rid of all of those other things. But just because we get rid of them and get rid of paying attention to them doesn't mean that they're not there, which I think is something that people overlook when it comes to noise. It's just because you're ignoring the train going by. And you maybe don't hear it anymore because you've lived in that house for so long and it goes by every 10 minutes. It still has physiological effects. Right. Yeah. The pressure of the noise is still hitting your ears. And I think it even it even happens when people are sleeping. They're like you can be, you know, effectively unconscious. Yeah. Like asleep in bed. But if there's something I forget what the actual decibel threshold is, but there's a point at which you you will still have the physiological response of like, you know, your blood pressure goes up. Something. Oh. Yeah, it will just even if you're even if you're still totally asleep. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and it's that same. It's that same sort of evolutionary. I mean, the 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 idea or the theory is that it's that same evolutionary response to danger. Mm -hmm. That like a loud sound, you know, you're going to go into fight or flight. But turns out you can even you you might go into little fight or flight. Yeah. Even if you're asleep. Mini fight or flight. Yeah. Like, fight or flight. <laughs> yeah. Like just the yeah. little one. Um, and it causes reactions in the amygdala, in the brain's emotional center, the amygdala, and also the nervous system responds as if it's a perceived threat, which is really yeah. interesting too. And it can cause adrenaline and cortisol and higher pulse rates, um, blood pressure raising, as you mentioned, and quicker breathing. And chronically, it can cause unhealthy side effects like hypertension and cardiovascular problems, a drain on mental health, work impairment, sleep disruption. Sure, yeah, if your yeah, if your blood, other stuff. blood pressure is always really high. Yeah, yeah, because you live in a place that's noisy. Because again, it's, it's this sound pressure that happens all the time. And just because your conscious brain can ignore it doesn't mean your subconscious can ignore it or yeah. your, your physical form is ignoring it. Uh, I used to live uh, one, the f second apartment that I ever lived in in New York, above Grand Train, right in my backyard, my, my bedroom facing out. Lasted a year. Lasted a year. Too much. Too much vibration. It was actually yeah, like things would shake. It was wow. hard. It was tough. That sounds. I thought for sure when I moved in because it was inexpensive that I would be able to do it. It's like oh, we'll just like we'll replace the windows. We'll get better. Ooh, even like low rumble just through the train tracks, through the ground, up through the foundation of the building. Like not even really a sound, just like a feeling. It's enough to... Ooh, that sounds horrible. It was rough. So with that, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back next week for the conclusion of this exciting episode about noise and what it does to your body. I think you're all going to be interested in this. It's going to be really cool. So make sure you subscribe for all of the episodes of Seeker Plus. Where can they find Reasonably Sound, Mike? You can find Reasonably Sound most places that you listen to podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> that seems like a good, uh, a good plug. Uh, and you can go to reasonablysound.com. Great. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. See you next time.